the Bible. This book has been vilified, has been challenged, attacked. In the late 1800s, Wellhausen and Tubigen did a historical critique on this book. There has been hundreds of challenges against this book. And for very good reason. When you look at the Old and the New Testament, particularly the Old Testament, there's a, the belief is that much of the Old Testament was borrowed from other sources. And the reason is, very, is because the earliest manuscript that we use for the Old Testament is the Masoretic text, which was written in 914 AD. That's just a little over a thousand years ago. It's a very recent text. In fact, it's even more recent than the New Testament. So what are we going to do? Well, Historians say that a good bit of the stories that you see included in the Old Testament, the stories that you see in Genesis, and of course uh, the stories surrounding the Abrahamic period, the Mosaic period, up through the Davidic period, 1900 B.C., 1400 B.C., uh, Davidic period, 1000 B.C., these probably did not happen, but they were then borrowed from other accounts. Certainly the creation story and the, uh, the story of the flood, those would have been borrowed from other accounts because we see much earlier references to those stories. In particular, the Gilgamesh epic, the Gilgamesh epic which was written in 6th century BC, the Gilgamesh epic which talks about the creation story. It's very similar to what you have in the Bible. And so historians believe that we cannot trust these stories because they are nothing more than these borrowings. We believe that Moses wrote the first five books of Moses, uh, including the book of Genesis, that Moses was responsible for writing the story about Abraham and all the others that we read up, including his own story. What are we going to do, though, to help these skeptics and the Muslims who go even one further step and believe that this book has been corrupted along the way by the Jews and the Christians, particularly the New Testament, and much of their attacks is against the New Testament writings? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to try to come up with answers to all of these challenges. Well, not all of them, but a lot of these challenges. We're going to try to show you how you can use a defense when these challenges are given. The Old Testament, we're going to look at the archaeological evidence. We're going to use a lot of the material that's come out of the British Museum. Uh, I lead a tour there uh, I've, uh, many weeks of the year. I go down to the British Museum. Uh, and the reason why is that the British themselves have scoured the world and they have grabbed as much as they could and stole it and brought it back to Britain and put it in that beautiful building. And now many people have vilified them for doing that, but thank God they did it because had they not brought it back and preserved it, it would not be there for us to look at. Much of that material that they have there in the British Museum would have been lost, it would have been sold, would have been broken up, put into mortar, put into buildings. The British saved it for our legacy because much of the material there is a legacy of what we're going to see in the Bible. Now, you may want to ask, hold on a minute, the Bible doesn't claim to be a historical book. But in order to answer this question on its credibility, on its authenticity, we need to go to history. Why? Because the Bible is full of history. There are four things that we need to look at to answer this question. There are four historical questions we need to answer. Basically, we need to look at people who live in history. We need to look at the places that exist in history. We need to look at the events that happen in history. And we need to look at the timelines or the time periods that they claim. And it's those four areas that we're going to do now. We're going to look at many of those names, places, peoples, events, dates as well. And we're going to see if there's any extra biblical evidence that supports them to prove that this book is accurate when it deals with history. We're not going to prove that this is the Word of God. I wouldn't have the audacity to assume that I can make that, that statement tonight. What I'm going to say is that when it deals with events that did happen in history, and we can find extra biblical material that happened at the same time, at the same places, with the same people, in every case the Bible is accurate. And if it's accurate at that, on those details, then we can trust what else it has to say. Okay, let's go ahead and let's start out with the first accusation concerning whether or not it has used an awful lot of borrowed material from other sources. Now, I guess let's start then with the, the accusation more specifically concerning the creation account. Because you do have the creation account in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And you also then have the flood account a little later. And those are the two areas that we see repeated in many, other, in many other documents. The Gilgamesh epic does talk about the creation account. It's very similar to the one we have in the Bible. So many historians believe that that may be the original, that may be the source for what we have written here. The problem is, if you come down to the British Museum, I'll show you a new tablet that has been on display there, which is called the Atarhasis. 
tablet, which also has almost the same story about uh, creation, but it was written in 1635 BC, over a thousand years earlier than the Gilgamesh epic. So why not consider that as the source? It hasn't changed in over a thousand years. Can you see the problem? Suggesting that maybe both the Gilgamesh epic and the Atrahasis tablet are using a much older source. Now we know the Atrahasis actually predates the books of Moses because Moses would have been writing in about 1400 BC. It's when you start asking these kind of questions that it starts getting pretty interesting. Now, Let's look at the flood accounts, because there is a flood account in Atrahasis tablet. Also, there is a flood account from the 6th century BC, similar to the flood account that we have here. But then you might find many flood accounts. In fact, what we now know is that there's over 200 flood accounts. Almost every culture has a flood account. The native Indians have a flood account, so do the Chinese, which seem to suggest, again, that if they all have a flood account, Maybe they are pointing back to an original flood account, which is what the Bible is speaking of. We can't prove that. We can't disprove that because that is almost prehistory. That goes beyond any written record. What can we prove? Well, one of the things that uh, historians look for whenever they're trying to find credibility in an archaic text is what they call embellishment. Deletions, accretions, things like this. Muslims help me out with this because they are also looking for this, but they're looking from the wrong angle. Muslims always come up to me and say, listen, Mr. Smith, how can you consider this to be the word of God? It is full of prophets who sin. David sins. Look at the sin that's in that prophet, that, uh, that your scriptures. Look at this sin of Abraham. In fact, every one of the prophets sin in your Bible. And my goodness, look at Rahab. She's a prostitute for heaven's sakes. Why would God ever use a prostitute in the line of succession going down to David? Now, what are they saying here? Well, basically, they're speaking from their own paradigm. They're speaking from their own cultural grid. Because when you look at their prophet, Muhammad, you will see that he's pretty amazing. In fact, he's so amazing that he's the best in every category. Have you noticed that the prophet Muhammad is the best husband? He's the best father. He's the best lover. He's the best king. He's the, basically, he's the best warrior in every category. He is the model. Which seems to suggest to me that there has been an embellishment. And when you look at the story of the prophet Muhammad, you ask when was it written down. It was not written at the time that Muhammad lived. It was written much, much later. In fact, the first record we have of Muhammad's life was written by a man named uh, Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq died in 765. Muhammad died in 632. You can see already that there's over 100 years difference. More than that, we don't have Ibn Ishaq's um, documents. We can't go to Ibn Ishaq to know exactly what he said about Muhammad. We have to go to one of his students named Ibn Hisham who died in 833. If Muhammad died in 632, Ibn Hisham died in 833. That's 200 years. 200 years before we hear the first reference to any, any uh, biography of Muhammad. 200 years of what? 200 years of oral tradition, 200 years of embellishment. So the very thing the Muslims are looking for is what they see in their own prophet. When they come back to my scriptures, suddenly they don't like the sins that are there. And I shake their hands when they say that. I say, thank you for doing that. Because in su su suggesting that these sins invalidate its historicity, you're actually proving its historicity. Because when a historian looks at that, the fact that the sins are left in proves its authenticity. See, had the Hebrews or the Jews had wanted to change it, don't you think they would have thrown those sins out? The fact that they left them in there proves their credibility. Look at the New Testament, much the same. In the New Testament, you have the disciples running away from Jesus when he is going to be arrested. Now, that's pretty embarrassing. A few hours later, Peter denies Christ three times. That's pretty embarrassing. What about Paul? Look at Paul. Everything he did, he got wrong. He didn't get along with anybody, including his own other disciples. Don't you think if they had wanted to re, uh, d uh, delete something or sanitize it, don't you think they would have thrown those out? The fact that they left those embarrassing parts in the New Testament proves its credibility historically. Thank God that the Old Testament writers and the Gospel writers did not throw out those desultory, what we call bad breath material. Because they left them in proves their credibility. And that's why historians are now looking anew at the Old Testament, and they're looking anew at the New Testament. Let's start with the Old Testament. Are there anything, are there any facts, are there any criteria that we can use to help support the historicity of the Old Testament? Let's start with the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, you have some cities 
that have always been disputed by the historians, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the city of Ur. You have the Hittites, for instance. The Hittites, which have always been doubted. In Genesis 36, verse 2, you have the reference to the Hittites. And historians have said, we don't know of any people called Hittites. We don't know of any city called Sodom and Gomorrah. Herodotus, the great historian, Thucydides, both Herodotus and Thucydides, who were writing in the 5th century, they don't mention any place called Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we would say, oh, oh, that seems obvious, because Sodom and Gomorrah were not existing at the time of Herodotus or Thucydides. They were destroyed long before that time. In fact, we know they were destroyed at the time of Abraham in 1900 B.C. But how are we going to prove that? Well, how are we going to prove this city of Ur? How are we going to prove about the Hittites? How are we going to prove that the story of Abraham is true? Many historians believe that this is not true, that much of the, of the story of Abraham could not have written by Moses. In fact, it used to be that they didn't believe that Moses, that anybody could write at the time of Moses. Now, that's been disputed long, long ago. If you come down to the British Museum in London, I will show you writing that goes back to 4000 BC. So, writing has been around a lawful long time. That's no longer in doubt. But what we can say, and what the historians are trying to say, is that certainly the story of Abraham is something that is not, probably not written by Moses in 1400 BC. It was probably written probably in the 6th century BC and redacted back to the 14th century BC or 15th century BC. I'm sorry, back to the time of Abraham, so it would be the 20th century BC. What are we going to do to help uh, alleviate these accusations? Well, we don't have to do too much. Things have been done for us, and that's the beauty of historical criticism. If you come to the British Museum, I'll show you some tablets that have been found. In fact, there have now been four genre of tablets that have been found. The Mari tablets, the Nuzi tablets, both out of the Euphrates Valley in Mesopotamia, which is present-day Iraq. The Ebla tablet, uh, tablets, which come from Syria. And the Amarna tablets, which come from Egypt. And it's these four families of tablets that have now been discovered in the last century, which are now starting to piece together what we see in the Genesis account. And they're exciting what they're telling us. Let's start with Abraham himself. And let's start and ask, what do we know about Abraham? Well, we know quite a bit about Abraham. We know that it was Abraham that um, uh, had all these customs that went on. We know that there's an awful lot that was happening in Abraham's life. If, according to the historians, if this was written in the 6th century, then pretty much what was writing, but if they're writing in the 6th century of what was happening in the 20th century, they would get many things wrong. Yet we've come across the Mari tablets, which, uh, the Mari tablets, which talk about the Ariyuk, or the Ariyak, which is found in Genesis 14. They mention the places Nahor and Haran, which are also found in Genesis 24, verse 10. And they also mention the name Benjamin and the Haperu. Haperu? Hold on to that. We're going to come back to that a little bit later. The Nuzi tablets are even more exciting. The Nuzi tablets, which have been found in the Mesopotamian area, they were written around 1800 BC, so they're written just after the time of Abraham. They talk about customs in that part of the world. They talk about the fact that a father can give a slave girl. They talk about the fact that a, a, a dowry has to be paid off for someone's wife and that you can be given a dowry. They talk about the fact that when you uh, steal a cult god, that it's a capital offense. All these different customs. In fact, we know of seven or eight different customs that are specific to the Abrahamic story that are all found in the Nuzi tablets. Yet if somebody had been writing this in the 6th century BC, how would they have known about these customs? Because every one of these customs would no longer have been in existence in the 6th century. They would have all died out. Proving that whoever wrote the Genesis account had to have been privy to that knowledge. But Moses wasn't privy to that knowledge. He wasn't living then. Moses was living in 1400 BC. How did he know what was happening in 1900 BC so accurately? Well, there's only two possibilities. Either this is very good oral tradition, or this is divine knowledge. I prefer the latter. What we do know is that almost all the tablets that are now coming out, the Mari and, the, and certainly the Nuzi tablets from just after the time of Abraham, they put Abraham in the right century, in the right place, at the right time. That's the beauty of this. And then they came across the Ebla tablets. Now, there was a mound in Syria, and whenever archaeologists find these mounds in the desert, they call them tells. And they love these tells because they know that underneath these tells are many, many, many cities. And they started digging down to the different layers of this tell, tell Marduk, they called it. And as they started digging down, they came down to the 2300-year period. 2300, that's 400 years before Abraham. In that, 
in that level they found a room whose roof had imploded on itself and at the floor of that room were 17,000 tablets all written in cuneiform. When they started looking through these tablets they came across one tablet in particular, one tablet with the names of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zebun, and Zoar. See what we've got here? We've got reference to Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the first and only reference anywhere in the world to prove that Sodom and Gomorrah did exist. They were written on this tablet, written 400 years before the time of Abraham. No wonder Herodotus or Thucydides didn't know about it. But here's the interesting thing. Did you hear the sequence I've just said? Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zebuim, and Zohar. What does that mean? Well, we know where Adma is. We know where Zebuim is. We know where Zohar are. In fact, if you look at them, they follow a line. In fact, they follow a trade line. This is a trade route. Much when you look at the five cities of the Levant, we always talk about the five cities of the Levant. We place them on the map and we talk about them. Over here we talk about Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo. What are we doing? We're following a line on a plane, aren't we? The same thing can be happened with these five cities. You're following a line on a plane, a trade line on the plane. Now hold on a minute. Have you heard those five cities in that order before? Yes, you have. If you've read Genesis chapter 14, verse 8, you will see the exact same five cities in the same order that were found on the Ebla tablets, proving that these cities were not only consequential for the people in the time of Ebla, but also at the time of Abraham. But hold on a minute. Abraham didn't write Genesis 14, 8. Moses wrote Gen Genesis 14, 8. Moses was living in 1400 BC. How would he have known to put Sodom and Gomorrah before Adma, Zebu, and Zohar? He wasn't there. These were, had been destroyed 400 years before he wrote this down. Where did he get this knowledge from? <laughs> well, pretty good oral tradition or maybe divine knowledge again. Can you see how accurate the Bible is? Not only does the Ebla tablets prove the existence of these two cities, it also coincides exactly with Genesis 14.8. What do we do with the Hittites? always been suspicious. Well, let's, before we get to Hittites, what are we going to do with the city of Ur? Ur was always a doubt, but it's no longer doubted anymore. If you were to come to the British Museum with me, I'll show you two rooms in the British Museum that have now been designated for the city of Ur. You will find the standard of Ur right there, dated to 2600 BC. 700 years before Abraham, you'll see the standard of Ur. Right next to it, you'll see a ram who is eating out of a bush. It's a, it's a part of a, a, a table lake, and it's made of a lapis lazuli and beautiful gold engraving, showing the sophistication that existed there in Ur in 2700 B.C. This is the same city that Abraham came out of that he was asked to leave in 1900 B.C., proving how sophisticated, how civilized a place that God would, had taken him out of. Ur no longer is doubted. Everybody knows Ur exists. The Bible was the first to tell us so. History just caught up with us. Good stuff, isn't it? What about the Hittites? They have now found the Hittites. They have found that the Hittites were entirely an enormous civilization. It was the Hittites who discovered horses and chariots. It was the Hittites who gave the chariots to the Egyptians. And it was the Hittites who were the ancestors of the Medes. Remember, it was the Medes, it was Darius the Mede, who in 539 destroyed Babylon. But stop and think, where else have we heard about the Medes? The Medes were also the first people to become Christians at the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, when they started speaking in different tongues, some of the first people to become Christian were Medes, who were the descendants of the Hittites. Who are the Medes today? They are the Kurds. The Kurds, and when you talk to any Kurds, what do they tell you? They tell you that they are 99% or 100% Muslim. And I say to my Kurdish friends, hold on a minute. Where does your history go back to? It goes back to Muhammad. I said, no, it doesn't. Come on, you Kurds. Your history predates Muhammad. It predates way beyond Muhammad. In fact, you were a Christian before my people were Christians. You have more of a right to be a Christian than I do because you are some of the first Christians that ever existed. You Kurds, forget about Muhammad. Go back and resurrect your history again. In fact, you were the people that God used to destroy Babylon. It was God that used you to destroy Babylon in 539. Look at your history. You were the people that were the Hittites that discovered not only how to tame horses, but to create chariots. You've got an enormous history. Please stop looking back to Abraham. I'm sorry, back to Muhammad. Go way beyond that. Go back and resurrect your past, of which also includes Jesus Christ. Thank God for the history that we have, and we need to help the Kurds to resurrect their ancestry, to prove that God has used them all the way through history. Now, let's continue, and let's 
get a little more recent. Let's talk about the 9th century BC, because here's where it starts to get exciting, because here's where it starts to impact on the history of the Israel itself. 9th century BC, you have a great, big, great kingdom called the Assyrian kingdom. The Assyrians who lived in what is today northern Iraq. There are four main cities that existed in the Assyrian kingdom. You had Nimrud, you had Balawat, you had Kosabad, and you had Nineveh. And you had the great Assyrian kings who were the ones who basically were the superpower of their day. At least we think they are. I'm going to dispel that in a few minutes. Because the Bible is going to tell me something different. But for now, let's talk about the Assyrians. Let's start with Shalmaneser III. Shalmaneser III um, was living in the mid-9th century. Now, that's the time that Ahab was living. Ahab was a very evil king. We see in 1 Kings chapter, chapter 22 that Ahab did not get along with his, his fellow neighbor king called Ben-Hadad. And the two of them were warring back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then suddenly they put their weapons down. We don't know why they put their weapons down. In chapter 22, it doesn't tell us. But what we do know is that Shalmaneser III, the great Assyrian king, was coming down and he was attacking Irhuleni, the great king of Hamath. We know that because there's a stella in the British Museum, and you'll see the stella there written in cuneiform, and it talks about that battle in the mid-9th century. He comes down and he attacks Irhuleni. Irhuleni cannot repulse this great Assyrian king, so he asks for help. He asks the other 11 kings of the plain to come to his help, including Ben-Hadad and Ahab. Now suddenly we realize why Ben-Hadad and Ahab put down their weapons. The stella shows us that they had to come to repulse Shalmanes III to come and help Irhuleni repulse Shalmanes III. There's the first evidence for 1 Kings chapter 22, extra biblical evidence. That's what we're looking for. You want another evidence? If you were down at the British Museum, I'd take you about 15 feet away to a big black obelisk. Black, it's called the black obelisk. It's actually gray now because now they've washed it up. It was discovered by the British there in Nimrud, the city of Nimrud. And it, it, it talks about a, well, let me, before I tell you what it talks about, let me talk, let's finish the story of Ahab. We do know in 2 Kings chapter 9 and 10 that Ahab died and that Elisha, the prophet Elisha, comes to the captain of the guard named Jehu. Who is Jehu? He's the captain of the guard. The Bible tells us that. Is he historical? Can we prove that? Yes, we can. See, a lot of the historians look at that and they say, these are nothing more than mythological names. These are nothing more than legendary names. Well, that is not the case if you look at the black obelisk. Because on the black obelisk, on the second top panel from the top, is a picture of a king over here with his retainers, and there's a man bowing down to him. And the man that's bowing down to him, according to the cuneiform at the very bottom, is Jehu, king of Israel. It says it right there in cuneiform. That's a picture of Jehu. The British have it. The British discovered him. It's the oldest picture we have of any king anywhere in the world. It's right there in the British Museum. And there he is in golden detail so that we now know that not only is 2 Kings chapter 9 and 10 correct, 1 Kings chapter 22 is correct as well. We have the name, the date, the place, the event of all the four things we're looking for. You want a third evidence? I'll take you another about 50 feet over, and I'll show you another glass cabinet there in the British Museum, and you can see a ruins of the city of Balawat. Now, this is the city that um, Shalmanes III had to, dis had to basically erect for himself. It was his summer palace. And when the uh, archaeologists dug down to the 9th century, mid-9th century, they came across some hinges, some hinges to a large, large door. The second top hinge of that door shows some soldiers being led uh, in captivity with their hands chained behind their backs, and it says in cuneiform at the bottom that these are Idhuleni's soldiers from Hamath, proving that what we see in 1 Kings chapter 22 was correct. This was the battle that not only dis helped destroy or was began to destroy Idhuleni, but because Ahab and Ben-Hadad came to his aid and the other, other nine kings came to his aid, they then repulsed Shalmanes III and sent him packing back up to Nimrud again. There's the third evidence that supports not only 1 Kings chapter 22, but 2 Kings chapter 9 and 10. Now, if we were to jump to kings, we would come to Tiglath-Pileser, who was dated to 745 to 727, the 8th century. Tiglath-Pileser is another important king because he's also important for our story. That's why we're looking at him. We're not looking at the other five kings in between because they are, do not come down to Phoenicia or they do not come down to Israel. Tiglath-Pileser does. He comes twice to Israel and he attacks Israel and he's mentioned nine times in our Old Testament. He's mentioned primarily in 2 Kings chapter 15. I'm sorry, yeah, 2 Kings chapter 15 and 1 Chronicles chapter 5. He's mentioned as Tiglath Pileser the third. But that's not the only reference that's given to him. In the Bible, he's also mentioned as Pul. 
Now, it's always been a curiosity for the historians. Who is this pull? Only the Bible mentions him like this. On the mural there on the wall there in the British Museum, you will see in cuneiform that the, uh, that, that the man that is pictured there on the left is Tiglath Pileser III, and his day, he's and uh, he's ruling there in Nimrud in the mid 8th century. But it mentions that his nickname is Pul, proving that the Bible's correct. The Bible is the only place anywhere in the world that mentions him by his nickname. And it wasn't until they finally, the British, found Nimrud that they came across this one mural that they proved that the Bible is even more correct than the historians. The historians didn't know who this pull was. Now they know. That's the nickname of Tiglath Pileser III, proving that whoever wrote 2 Kings and 1 Chronicles had been living at that time, had been privy to that, that knowledge, showing how accurate our Bible is. We jump another two kings, we come to Sargon II. Sargon II, uh, his dates are 722 to 701, and we read about him in 2 Kings chapter 17. Sargon II we also read about in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. He's actually mentioned by name. Sargon II, we know, is the king who comes and attacks the ten northern tribes of Israel, takes him into captivity up to Assyria. He is the one that built the great city of Korsabad. And then what he does, he takes a lot of his people to go back down to Israel to repopulate the cities that he's left behind. They then marry with the people that are left behind, and out of their progeny come the Samaritans. Why do I say that? Why is that important? Well, this book here, the Quran, tells us, that when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, this is in 1400 BC, when he went up to Mount Sinai, it was a Samaritan who built the golden calf. Now stop and think that through. Moses lived in 1400 BC. Sargon II created the Samaritans out of the progeny of the people he brought back into the, the defeated cities. So that could not have happened because, uh, until the 8th century. Yet the Quran tells us there were Samaritans in the 15th century. Can you see a problem with that? See, the Quran's full of these kind of errors. This is a historical anachronism. How can you have a Samaritan living in 1500 B.C. when they were not invented until the 8th century B.C.? Okay, do you see the problem? Thank God for this architecture. Thank God for these artifacts. Thank God that we can look at these artifacts, put them together, put dates on them, and realize that they corroborate the Bible, but in the same time, they're corroborating the events that we see in the Bible. They eradicate their authority for the Quran in one fell swoop. They put one up and the other one down. But it's not Sargon II that I like. I like his son, Sennacherib. He's exciting. You should all know about Sennacherib. Sennacherib, his dates are 704 to 681. We read about Sennacherib in 2 Kings chapter 19. Uh, also, we read about him in Isaiah chapter 37. Sennacherib comes and does what his father did not do. He decides to attack the, the tribe of Judah. Now, the tribe of Judah was the tribe that stayed very close to the Lord. At the time that Sennacherib was living, uh, the king at that time was Hezekiah, who is a very righteous king. And he attacks the tribe of Judah and destroys all the four to five cities. He only has two cities left to go, Tarak, uh, Lachish, sorry, Lachish and Jerusalem. Now, when the British went to Lachish, they came across a lot of the artifacts from that battle. And in that, on the, uh, and, and that you'll see they found some arrowheads and some stones from the rocks. But they also went to Nineveh, because Nineveh is the city that Sennacherib built. And when they went to Nineveh, they found the Lachish room. This is the room that depicts that battle. It's on a wall. They didn't have newspapers, and they didn't have radio or television at that time. So they would put a mural along the wall with art, pictures, or pictures of the battle all the way along it. And in that room, they came across a prism. The man who found it was named Taylor, so they call it the Taylor prism. And in the prism is a six-sided prism. On one of the panels is the story of Lachish. And it mentions seven things. Now, I can't remember the top of my head exact seven things, but the seven things that it mentions exactly parallel what we see in 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 17 and also, I'm sorry, uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 19, I said that, and sec no, 2 Kings chapter 19, Isaiah chapter 37. I'll get it correct, you can just bear with me. 2 Kings chapter 19 and Isaiah 37. First of all, it mentions that Hezekiah rebelled against Sennacherib. So we now know that Hezekiah is historical. He's mentioned on the Taylor prism. It mentions that Sennacherib comes and destroys all the fortified cities. That also agrees with 2 Kings chapter 19. It mentions that Lachish also fell, but Jerusalem didn't. It mentions that Hezekiah pays 30 talents of gold to basically in homage to Sennacherib. It didn't work, obviously. And then it mentions, along with 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah 37, that Sennacherib, when he came to Jerusalem, he suddenly went home. But it doesn't tell us why. 
Now, you'd like to know why Sennacherib suddenly went home, don't you? Wouldn't you like to know? I know the historians would love to know, but it doesn't say on the Taylor prism. So where are you going to go to find out what, went, what happened or why he had to suddenly go home? You've got to come to the Bible. You've got to come to this book. This is the only book that tells us what was going on. And what this book says in Isaiah 37 and 2 Kings 19 is that he had to go back to Nineveh because somebody was attacking his southern flank. And that somebody who was attacking his southern flank was named Tirhaka or Taharka, depending on where you put the vowels. Now, who in the world is this Taharka? There is no reference to anybody called Taharka in any of the, and certainly in any of the historians. You, Herodotus does not know of any Taharka. Thucydides doesn't talk about any Taharka, and historians have always doubted whether this is a real historical character. They always thought, again, that this is another legendary mythological character that is always written in the Bible. Well, the British Museum has now solved the problem for us. The British Museum has now found who Taharka is. But I'm going to wait on that. I'm not going to tell you who he is right now. Let's go and, and let's come back to him. No, let's do talk about that. Let's do talk about who this Taharka is. If you come to the British Museum and you come into the Egyptian room, you will find out who he is. But in order to know who he is, you're going to have to be able to read the writing along the base of this one statue, a statue of a ram. And there's a man standing between the legs of the ram who's named Taharka. But the British and the French didn't know how to read that because the language that was used was hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics was a lost language. No one knew how to read it until the Rosetta Stone was discovered in the 1800s. When they came across the Rosetta Stone, they were able to look at it because on the Rosetta Stone, it had three different languages. It had hieroglyphics, it had demotic, and it had Greek. They knew demotic, they knew Greek, and by looking and comparing the hieroglyphics with the other two languages, they were able to reproduce the hieroglyphic alphabet. And by doing that, they could then unlock all the artifacts, and that's where Egyptology came into existence. It was the British and the French that discovered it. It was them that invented it. And it was they that finally looked at this one artifact that they had in this crate there in one of the 17 warehouses all over London. They came across this one little crate, and there in the bottom was the reference to Tiraka. He has now been discovered, and the British Museum has discovered it. He was a Kushite king. He was a Kushite king whose dominion was spread all the way from Ethiopia in the east, all the way to Senegal, what would be called Senegal today, that whole part of North Africa was under his jurisdiction. He was a superpower of his day. He was so important, in fact, you can now understand why when Sennacherib suddenly went home, he had to go home because this was the other superpower that nobody seemed to know about. Nobody knew about him except the Bible. The Bible is the only place that mentions him by name. Now, a few years ago, I found it fascinating in the newspaper, I read that they have come across the Kushite burial chambers in the, in, the, in the deserts of Egypt. And they, as they came across these burial chambers, these pyramids that are underground, they noticed that the largest pyramid was the pyramid of this man named Teharka, or Tirhaka. And they looked at it and they said, it seems, to, to, it seems rather curious, but this man named Teharka was the last of the great Kushite kings. And something happened during his raids that started the decline of the Kushites. They don't know what it is. And I'm raising my hand over here, and I said, I know what it is. If you just come back to 2 Kings chapter 19, and if you just come back to Isaiah 37, it'll tell you the answer. The answer is right there in the Bible. What started the decline of the Kushites? It was Sennacherib that started that decline. As, as Tiraka came to attack him, thinking he would be away down, way down there in Israel, he comes back and destroys Tiraka. He comes back a broken man, which started the decline. It's right there in the Bible. If they just come back to the Bible, they would read it right there in black and white. And that's why I love this whole process. See, the more they scratch, the more they find. The more they find, the more we shine. Oh, how sublime. No wonder they whine. <laughs> This is what history does. They're basically doing the work for us, aren't they? They are the ones who are finding the rocks. Now, if we're not going to cry out, the rocks are going to cry out. The rocks are basically reproducing our history for us. They are the ones that are finding our material. We don't even have to do it. We just have to sit back and let them find it. And they're finding what we've already known. In this case, we've known about Tithaka for 2,700 years. They're just now catching up. Good stuff, isn't it? But we still haven't finished with Sennacherib. We've got to come back with Sennacherib. Okay, let's come back to Sennacherib, and let's come back to the um, uh, 8th century, to the 7th century, around 6, 681. Sennacherib then comes back to Jerusalem a second time. After he's destroyed and taken care of this mysterious king, who's no longer mysterious, we now have him pictured in the British Museum. The Bible is very clear as to who he is. He then comes back to Jerusalem a second time, doesn't he? There's a mural in the British Museum that depicts that event, and it mentions there in cuneiform that he comes back with his whole army, now, 
Picture the scenario. Sennacherib comes all the way from Nineveh. He comes all the way down to Jerusalem. It's a long journey. He's tired. He goes to bed that night in his tent. The next morning, he stretches. Oh, I think he does anyhow. And then he opens up the flap of the tent. And what does he see when he looks outside? Well, you're going to have to come back to the Bible to see what he sees, but I'm going to come back to it because I'm going to hold on to that a minute. I'm going to see what the, that panel tells me. Because when you go to the panel in the British Museum, you will see that it says nothing. It just says he comes to Jerusalem and then he suddenly goes home. That's all it says. It doesn't tell you anything. Now, when you look at the British Museum, when you look at all these panels and these tablets and these murals and these obelisks and these stellas, they're huge, they're expensive. The only people that can make these large objects are kings themselves. That's why the whole history of the Assyrian period, the Babylonian period, are all basically the history of the kings. It's their history. That's the, they're the only people rich enough to make these objects. And they're the only ones that want us to know their history. And when they're writing their history, they want to do something very clearly, and that is they only want to tell you what went right. Well, they're just like politicians today, aren't they? Don't politicians do that? Does anybody ever, any politi have you known of any politician that admits that they may have done something wrong? No politician in his right mind would do that. We call that political spin. Well, look at they're not the first to do it. The Assyrians were doing it way back in the 9th and 8th century BC. It's been around as long as we've known politicians. And that's exactly the problem with these murals. They only tell you the, what they want you to know. You only hear history from their perspective. You only hear the history from the winner's perspective. You heard this many times before. I'm not telling you anything new. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Here's that mural, and all it says is he comes to Jerusalem, and he suddenly goes home. Well, I'd like to know why he went suddenly home. Why is there no, no reference to any conquest? Because that's what kings do. They conquer. They conquer, and when they conquer, they tell about their conquest. Every one of those stories is full of their conquest. Most of the murals are basically talking about their conquest. They talk about how many kings they've destroyed, how many cities they've been leveled to the ground, how much booty they brought back home. Yet there's no reference to it anywhere on the Hezekiah mural. We call it the Hezekiah mural because it mentions Hezekiah by name. Again, like the Taylor prism. So what are we going to do? Well, if you go upstairs, you will find the Babylonian Chronicles. The Babylonian Chronicles mention that when Sennacherib returns home back to Nineveh, his two sons rise up and kill him. Now, why in the world would his two sons kill a king who has just destroyed one of the other great superpowers of his day, that character named Tiraka that the Bible only knows about? Why in the world would they destroy the king at the height of his power unless something embarrassing happened? What happened in Jerusalem? What happened outside of Jerusalem? Let's go back to that scenario I left you at. He stretches, right? He's stretching, waking up, opens the flap, and what does he see? You're going to have to go back to 2 Kings chapter 19. You're going to have to go back to Isaiah 37. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 9, Isaiah chapter 37, and you see it specifically. When he looks out, he sees 185,000 of his men lying there on the ground, dead. 185 of his soldiers, decimated. He didn't remember or hear any battle in the night. He heard no clanking of swords. He heard no screams or shout of pain. He never saw any other soldiers, no Jewish soldiers there. Can you imagine putting yourself in his place? What would you do in his place? Well, I'd get home pretty quick, wouldn't I? And that's exactly what he, had, what he did. And that's why the Babylonian Chronicles, when they mention when he came home, you can imagine all the relatives of those 185,000 men, they would want to know what had happened to their men. They would be there questioning, where are our men? What happened to them? What is he going to do? How is he going to explain this? There was no battle. There is no booty. No one was conquered. 185,000 men dead. Can you see why it's embarrassing? No wonder his sons rose up and killed him. But none of that is on this mural. So what is the historian going to do? What's he going to do? How is he going to answer this question? The only way he can answer this question is to come back to the Bible. Is come, to come back to 2 Kings chapter 19, Isaiah 37. But he's not going to do that for two very good reasons. Because if he comes back and listens to the story in the Bible, he's first of all going to have to accept that there's a God. Secondly, he's going to have to accept that that God enters time and space and impacts on human history. Can you see the dilemma for the historian? They do not want to accept that. So all they're going to do is accept what they see on the mural and call it a mystery. It's not a mystery to us. 
See, there is the beauty. We can put both of them together, both the Bible and the artifacts. Both the Bible and the murals can be put together. We need the murals. We need the obelisks. We need the stellas. Why? Because they place it in history. They put the stories in a time frame. They put the people in the right places, in the right events, using the right, certainly the right times. And that's why we need to make sure that we put the two together. We need the historical artifacts because it gives it historicity. But we need the Bible because it gives us the rest of the story. This is God's story. But it's historical. It did happen with the right people in the right places at the right time. Good stuff, isn't it? That's why I love the Bible. That's why I love the Old Testament. Now I'm going to jump to Daniel. Daniel I love. See, Daniel the historians don't like. Daniel has always been a problem for the historians. They've always hated Daniel. And the reason they don't like Daniel is because Daniel deals with something that historians don't like, much like we saw earlier with Sennacherib. They don't like it because what Daniel does is he talks about that which is going to happen in the future. He talks about prophecy. In the book of Daniel, you'll have reference to four kingdoms. Now, two of them are not prophetic because uh, they talk about Babylon. Well, Daniel's living in Babylon. We're in the 6th century B.C. now. He's living in Babylon, so that's not prophetic. Uh, they talk about Darius, who under the auspice of Cyrus the Great, destroys Babylon in 539. Well, that's not prophetic because Daniel was there. He was privy to that. He was a eyewitness to that event. But then they talk about, Daniel talks about two other kingdoms. About the Greeks, who don't exist until the 3rd century. That's 300 years later. And then the Romans, who don't exist until the 2nd century. That's 400 late years later. No wonder the historians don't like it. How could somebody living in the 6th century know what's going to happen in the 3rd and the 2nd century? No, that they don't like because nobody can know the future like that. So what the historians have done is they have tried to find any, any error in the book of Daniel. And they have scoured the book of Daniel to find any error and they found it. And it has to do with Belshazzar. See, in the book of Daniel, Belshazzar is the king that, under, uh, that Daniel's working under, isn't he? Belshazzar is there. In fact, Belshazzar has that great feast, and there's that writing on the wall, and he has, can anybody interpret that writing for me? And Daniel comes and interprets it for him, and then he turns to Daniel, and he said, because of what you have done, you will be number three in my kingdom. It says that in Daniel chapter 5, verse 16. Now, we, many people have queried, why number three? If Belshazzar is number one, wouldn't he be number two? That's a mystery. That's kind of a, we're going to answer that in a little while, but hold on to that. But certainly the difficulty is that Belshazzar is the wrong person. Why do we know that? Well, if you come to the British Museum, I'll show you. When you go up into the Mesopotamian room, when you go into the Babylonian room specifically, you can see all the artifacts from that time period, from the 6th century, and they are all written by, not Belshazzar, but by Nabonidus. Nabonidus is the last king. In fact, Herodotus, who's just living 100 years later, 100 years later, in the 5th century, he refers to Nabonidus and mentions that he's the last of the Babylonian kings. It was Nabonidus that was king when Babylon was destroyed. No reference anywhere to a man named Belshazzar. Only the Bible talks about Belshazzar, which seemed to suggest we've got the wrong king. The historians have found an error in Daniel. It's a pretty glaring error. Looks like they got us over a barrel, don't they? <laughs> Except for one little barrel. One incy little bear, only about this big, that's there in the British Museum. Most people walk right by it, and I stop them and say, take a look at that barrel, don't walk by, you've got to look at that barrel. This little barrel is a little barrel written in cuneiform, round barrel, little brown barrel, that was found in the city of Ur. Until they discovered Ur, they didn't know this barrel existed. It was found in the ziggurat there in Ur, and when they looked at it and they started interpreting or translating the cuneiform, they found that this was a prayer by Nabonidus. It's a prayer by Nabonidus for his son, Belshazzar. There it is. It's the only place, any in, where place in the world that mentions Belshazzar by name. He's the son of Nabonidus. And it's on that little drum there in the British Museum. But that still doesn't solve the problem. Because why is it no one knows about Belshazzar? Why didn't Herodotus not know about Belshazzar? Well, to understand that, you need to go about 15 feet away to another glass cabinet, and there's another tablet. It's tablet, I think, number 26. On that tablet, in cuneiform, it mentions, written by Nabonidus, it says for the last 10 years of his life, basically he was retired. He was, he was tired. So he went back down to Teman in Arabia and left the ruling of his kingdom to his son. But it doesn't mention who his son is. It just mentions that he is his son. We now know who his son is. His son is Belshazzar which means that he and his son were co-regents. 
Now do you understand when Daniel says, in, Dan, when, uh, in Daniel 5, 16, when Belshazzar says, you'll be number three in my kingdom. He and his father were one and two. What does that say to you? Well, I know what it says to me. It proves to me that whoever wrote the book of Daniel had to have been privy to that knowledge, had to have been living in the 6th century to have known that both Belshazzar and Nabonidus were co-regents at that time. That's why Daniel would be number three. That's how accurate the book of Daniel is. But it's even more than that. Why is it, you need a question, why is it that Herodotus did not know this? Remember what I said earlier. Everything that you find in these artifacts, these large artifacts, whether they're stellos or murals or tablets, or, or um, obelisk, what are they? They are nothing more than uh, bragging accounts of a king's conquests. Belshazzar was a co-regent with his father. He hadn't done any conquests yet. Why? He would not dare do any conquering because if he conquered anything, who would get the credit? His father would get the credit. So he's waiting for his father to die. Once his father died, then he would go out and start conquering, and then there would be many things written about him. But before that could happen, Darius and Cyrus then came and destroyed Babylon, including himself. That's why even a hundred years later, Herodotus didn't even know about Belshazzar. Nobody knows about Belshazzar but the book of Daniel. Thank God the book of Daniel is accurate. Thank God for that little drum over here and that little piece of uh, tablet just 15 feet apart not only support the authenticity for the book of Daniel, but place the book of Daniel in the 6th century, proving that these are prophecies about the Greeks and the Romans. Now, why is it I like the book of Daniel in particular? I like the book of Daniel because Muslims are always questioning my Lord Jesus Christ. They're always questioning his divinity. And they're saying, if you look at the New Testament, the title that Jesus gives to himself more than any other is the Son of Man. Isn't that right? About 25 times you will see that Jesus is referred to as the Son of Man. Now, I like to know who the Son of Man is. Muslims claim that he's nothing more than a man. Well, they've not read the book of Daniel. Because in chapter 7, verse 14 of the book of Daniel, it is very clear who the Son of Man is. It defines it right there in the book of Daniel. For he will come, the Son of Man will come in the clouds. He will be, he is from everlasting to everlasting, who will have dominion over all tribes, nations, peoples, and tongues. That is as divine a claim as you can make. The Son of Man can be nothing more than God himself. So when Jesus claimed to be the Son of Man, not a Son of Man, we're all sons of men. When he claimed to be the Son of Man, he was claiming to be God. The Jews knew that. They trusted the book of Daniel. So need the Muslims. They need to trust the book of Daniel. We now know it's historical. We now know it's accurate. Thank God it's accurate because now I know exactly who Jesus was claimed to be. Good stuff, isn't it? That's why I like the Old Testament. Now, let's take a look. We now have been able to find 50 Old Testament people have been found and corroborated by extra-biblical evidence. Let's look and see what the experts say. And to do that, we need to look and see what they're quoting. And I'm going to quote their quotes. These are well-known archaeologists. Let's take a look and see what they say. G.E. Wright states this. We shall ne probably never prove that Abram really existed. But what we can prove is that his life and times, as reflected in stories about him, fit perfectly within the early second millennium, but imperfectly within any later period. How can he say that? Well, he's saying that because of the Nuzi tablets, and the Mari tablets, and the Ebla tablets. All these tablets that are found in Syria, and in Mesopotamia, and the Euphrates Valley, not only support the historicity of the Abrahamic story, but put him in the right century and in the right place. That's why G.E. Wright is saying that. Until we found these tablets, we didn't know how accurate the, New, the Old Testament was, or the book of Genesis was, or the Mosaic account about what Abraham was doing. Sir Frederick Kenyon, well-known archaeologist, mentions the evidence of archaeology has been to reestablish the authority for the Old Testament, and likewise to augment its value by rendering it more intelligible through a fuller knowledge of its background and setting. William F. Albright, a renowned archaeologist, says this, the excessive skepticism shown towards the Bible by important historical schools of the 18th and 19th centuries. Certain phases, which still appear periodically, has been progressively discredited. Discovery after discovery after discovery has established the accuracy of innumerable details and has brought increased recognition to the value of the Bible as a source of history. What discovery is he talking about? The Shalman is the third stella. The, the hinges there on Balawat. The Tigla Pileh is the third mural that is found there that mentions even the nickname of Tigla Pileh. The Sargon uh, tablet, the uh, mural that shows not only Sargon II but Sennacherib. The, the, the Taylor prism that shows how accurate 2 Kings 19 is and Isaiah 37. And also 
the Tir Hakab statue that is now there in the British Museum. Article after article, artifact after artifact, all the tablets, the Nuzi, the Mari, the Ebla, the Armarna. Oh, I forgot about the Armarna tablets. The Amarna tablets. The Amarna tablets which were discovered in Amarna in Egypt, written in 1394. And they talk about these people, these stateless people, written by the governor in, in uh, Canaan to the uh, pharaoh living there in Amarna, which was the capital of Egypt at that time. He said there are these stateless people who would come down from the hills and they would attack the cities, but they'd leave some of the cities alone. Now stop and ask, who was living at the time of 1394? Joshua was living at that time, wasn't he? Joshua. What was Joshua doing? He was up in the hills, coming down, attacking these cities, Jericho and the rest. And remember the Midianites, the, I'm sorry, the Ibionites who come to him with dirty shoes and dusty clothes. And they say, we are from a far distance. Can we have an alliance with you? He has an alliance with them. And then they say, well, actually, we're right next door. Too late. He's already shaken their hands. So therefore, he has to uh, acknowledge and ad 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 adhere to his alliance. So he leaves them alone, exactly corroborating what we see in the book of Joshua. Exactly corroborating, sorry, what we see in the Amarna tablets. Can you see then why Miller Burroughs and William F. Albright says these things? It's these artifacts that are corroborated almost exactly what we see. Now, the British Museum has always been one of the most skeptical of institutions. I like to know what they say about all this. There next to the Amarna tablets, if you were to go, you will see that they have a little... Uh, tablet itself, a uh, little reference to these tablets, and they mention these roving Canaanite people who come from the hills coming down to raid the cities in the plains, and they say these stateless Canaanites are probably the biblical Hebrews. What in the world is the British Museum admitting that these are the Hebrews? Why have they come to this conclusion? Further on the wall is a mural that they have put up, that they have erected just around two or three years ago, that talks about the story of David. The story of David right out of our Bible. They have paraphrased the story of David right out of our Bible. Now, that astounded me when I saw that. The British Museum, the most skeptical of institution, admits that David did exist, admits that this is historical, admits that this happened. It reminds me of what Jasper said. He said, Jasper said, remember that these great thinkers and these great philosophers and these great scientists, they're all trying to find that, that pillar of knowledge and they're climbing that hill trying to get up to the pinnacle and sooner or later they're going to make it to the top and when they get there they'll find the theologians waiting for them. They're already there. Why? Because of all these artifacts that are corroborating what the Bible is already saying. No wonder uh, G.E. Wright, Sir Frederick Kenyon, William F. Albright are saying this. Let's see what Miller Brown Burroughs says out of Yale. He states, on the whole, archaeological work has unquestionably strengthened confidence in the reliability of the scriptural record. Joseph Free, another renowned archaeologist, confirms that while thumbing through the book of Genesis, he mentally noted that each of the 50 chapters are either illuminated or con confirmed by some archaeological discovery, and that this would be true for most of the remaining chapters of the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament. Nelson Gluck, a Jewish reform scholar and archaeologist, probably gives us the greatest support for the Bible when he states, to date, no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a single properly understood biblical statement. Look at that. These are the men that have spent their whole life studying our Bible. These are the men who have been skeptics of themselves. If they have come to this conclusion, why should we complain? Why should we disagree? What about the New Testament? What are you going to do with the New Testament? And this is the part of the, the Bible that the Muslims have basically uh, targeted the most, challenged the most. Why? Because there's so much in the New Testament that contradicts the Quran. They've got to target it. They've got to challenge it. So have the skeptics got to challenge it. And they have been targeting it right, left, and center. Oh, they made all kinds of accusations. Well, let, before we get into those accusations, let's look and see. And let's do the same historical test that we've done just to the Old Testament. Let's look for the names, places, dates, and events. The same thing we looked in the Old Testament, we need to also apply to the New Testament. And the most historical book in the New Testament is the book of Acts. It's a book of the Acts of the Apostles. It's a book of the Acts of the early church. It is the book of the history of the early church, is it not? So let's go to the book of Acts and let's ask it whether or not it is historical. There have been lots of in good number of challenges against the author of the book of Acts because of the, some of the words he used, some of the people he talked about, some of the events that he mentioned there in the book of Acts. For instance, there was always a reference, there was always a problem with the reference in Acts chapter 14, verse 6, to the fact that Lystra and Derbe were in Lyconia. Cicero writes that these two cities were in Iconium. 
Whoever wrote the book of Acts got them in the wrong place. Now there has been a monument that has been discovered that puts both Lystra and Derby in Lyconia and not in Iconium. It looks like Cicero is wrong and the book of Acts is right. Erastus was a Corinthian treasure according to Romans 16, verse 23. Now, hold on a minute. Erastus is not a Corinthian treasure according to many of the historians. That was until a payment was found which supports it in 1929 that supports that Erastus was the name of a Corinthian uh, treasure supporting Romans 16:23. The author of the book of Acts, we know he's Luke, mentions that Pol Polytarch was a civil authority in Thessalonica. Now, this was always doubted because there's no reference. There has never been any reference to any Polytarch who's a civil authority in Thessalonica. We see that in Acts chapter 17, verse 6. Now, in the last century, 19 inscriptions have been found supporting the fact that Polytarchs were civil authorities. Five of the inscriptions mention that they were authorities in Thessalonica, proving that the book of Acts is correct. Luke was correct. He mentions that a praetor was a Philippian ruler. Now, according to the historians, a Philippian ruler should have been in Demir. That would have been more accurate. Now they have found that praetor was the earlier name. Demir was a later name that was applied to them. The praetor is the earlier name, and it's the name that was used in the first century, proving that the book of Acts is, is more accurate, but also starts to date the book of Acts. But we can get even more, more uh, clear than that. If you want to date the book of Acts, probably the best thing to do is to go to Acts, Acts chapter 18, verse 12. There it mentions that Gallo is a proconsul. Now that has always been disputed because Pliny, the great historian Pliny, mentions Gallo, but never mentions once that he's a proconsul which seems to suggest that whoever wrote the book of Acts got this wrong, possibly because the book of Acts would have been written in the second century and redacted back to the first century. We'll go with Pliny because he's closer to the event. That's what the historians have always said. That was until the Delphi inscription was discovered. The Delphi inscription mentions that, the book of, that, uh, that Gallo was a proconsul for one year and one year alone in 52 AD. Now, what does that suggest? Well, that tells me that whoever wrote the book of Acts had been writing around 52 AD. We now can date the book of Acts to around 52 AD. Christ died in 33 AD. That's just within 20 years of Christ's death, you have the book of Acts written. Now, that's always been a huge accusation of the, book of, of the New Testament, that it's written much, much too late to be considered to be authentic. But here we have the book of Acts written within 52 AD. We can get even more specific than that, because there's events that happened to the early church that are not written in the book of Acts. For instance, the martyrdom of James, the brother of, of Jesus. He was martyred in 62 AD. That's not mentioned in the book of Acts. The martyrdom of Paul in 64 AD. That's not mentioned in the book of Act, Acts. The martyrdom of Peter in 65 AD. That's not mentioned in the book of Acts. Or the insurrection by the Jews there in Jerusalem in 66 AD. Or the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Every one of these events had a huge impact on the early church. Why are they not re referenced in the book of Acts? Because they were, happened after the book of Acts was written which then suggests that the book of Acts would have been written between 52 AD and 62 AD. Are you following me? Now, we know that Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke before the book of Acts. That would mean it had to be written some before 52 AD, along with Matthew. They were written both together. Mark would have written, been written even before that. The letters of Paul would have been written within 15 years of Christ's death. So you have all of Paul's letters plus three of the Gospels written within 20 to 30 years of Christ's death. Why is that important? I'll tell you why that's important. It's important because it puts the majority of the New Testament within 20 to 30 years of Christ's death, and it has them written while the disciples were still living in Jerusalem. They were the eyewitnesses to all these events. Therefore, they could either dispute or reject or accept that which is written. Even Luke, he didn't know of any of this. He never knew Jesus Christ. Remember he says right there in the first three verses of the first chapter of Luke, O Theophilus, I've taken it upon myself. Basically, I am writing what you've told me. Correct me if I'm wrong. He's basically written it for the disciples. He's writing their story for them. So it was written while they could read it, before they were thrown out of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That's why it's so important. Now, let's do a comparative here, real quickly. The Muslims don't like that, but then I'll ask them, take a look and ask, what is it you have about your prophet? Where is it you get your material for your prophet? Well, we all know this, that the, uh, the biography of Muhammad is the Siddha. That's called the Siddha of Muhammad. Well, we've got the same co correspondence in the New Testament. The biography of Jesus would be the gospel account of Jesus, the black letters part of the, of the gospel account. There's the Siddha of Jesus. The sayings of Muhammad would be the Hadith. Well, we have the Hadith of Jesus, don't we not? 
the sayings of Jesus would be the letter part, red letter part of the Gospels, right? If you have a red letter Bible. And then you have the tafsir, which would be the commentaries that explain what Muhammad said and did. Well, we also have the tafsir in the New Testament. The tafsir would be basically Paul's letters. He explains what Jesus said and did. So the tafsir of Jesus is Paul's letters. That's written within 15 years of Christ's death. And then you have the last genre of the traditions called the tahrik, which would be the history. Well, the book of Acts is as historical as you can get. So there's the tahrik of the early church, which would be the book of Acts, written, uh, we now know, between 52 and 62 AD. So we have the tafsir, the tahrik, the hadith, and the sira of Jesus, all written within 20 to 30 years of Christ's death. We have the sira, the tafsir, the hadith, and the tahrik of Muhammad, written into two to 300 years after Muhammad's death, which is more authoritative. 20 to 30 years or two to 300 years? <laughs> what a comparative. Thank God we've got 20 to 30 years for everything. It's all there while the disciples were still living in Jerusalem. That's why I love the New Testament. Oh, they may not like that, but then they got, to answer, they got an awful lot to answer for. We don't have the problems that Muslims have. Thank God they were. Now, here's the other question. How do we know what we have in our hands today are those what were originally written down? That's the big question. Why? Because we don't have the originals of any of them for one very good reason. When they wrote them down, they wrote them on papyri. Papyri are those leaves, those interlocking leaves that they hammered out and they dried so they could make a, a material that they could write on and those disintegrated very quickly. Well, within a hundred years, they would disintegrate. They would just dry up and crinkle. If you come to the British Library, uh, we have examples of papyri there, fragments of papyri. And if you pick them up in your hands, they just crinkle in your hands. We wouldn't expect any of the papyri to exist till today. They would, have, they, would have, they would start to deteriorate within 100 years. So copies need to be made immediately, and copies of copies of copies of copies. You have whole generations of copies of papyri for the New Testament. So what do we have? Well, let's look at some of the things that we do have, because we do have lots of manuscripts of the New Testament. We've got about 5,300 Greek manuscripts. We've got about another 10,000 Latin Vulgates, another 9,000 in other language. You add them all up together, we have about 26,000 manuscripts for the New Testament alone. That's an awful lot of manuscripts. Are they very early? No. Only 230 of them, either full manuscripts or portions thereof, predate the 6th century. And it's those 230 that we've spent most of our time, the experts are spending most of their time looking at, because they're the most authoritative, they're the most authentic. Now, historians don't like that. They say they're much, much too late. Let's just stop and ask, and let's hold on a minute, and let's do a comparative. Historians may not like that, but then why is it they like all the secular manuscripts? See, because there's no, I never hear any Muslims ever complain about Herodotus or Thucydides. Herodotus and Thucydides who are writing in the 5th century BC. When is it we get the earliest copies for any of their writings? We don't get the earliest copy. The earliest copies we have for any of their writings is not till 900 AD. That is 1,300 years later. Yet nobody disputes Herodotus or Thucydides. We have Aristotle, the philosopher. Everybody reads Aristotle. He was living in the 4th century BC. Yet the earliest copy we have for his material is not to 1100 AD. That's 1400 years later, and we only have five copies of it. We could go on. Caesar's history, written in the 2nd century BC. The earliest copy we have for Caesar's history is not to 900 AD. That is 1,000 years later, and we only have 10 copies of it. Pliny, the great historian, Pliny, that I've already mentioned tonight, Pliny, the historian who is writing and about the same time that the Gospel accounts, or the, the New Testament was being written, excuse me, the earliest copy we have of any of Pliny's writing is not till 850 AD. That is 750 years later, and we only have seven references to him. Yet nobody disputes Herodotus or Thucydides or Aristotle or Caesar or Pliny or Suetonius or Tacitus or any of these other historians. No one ever disputes whether they're authentic, yet we don't have any of them before the 9th century AD. Everybody wants to dispute the New Testament documents. Yet look how early some of our documents are. The John Rylands manuscript, which are fragments from the book of John from 130 AD. That's the 2nd century. They're in Switzerland. If you come to England, up in Manchester, we have the John, John Rylands manuscript. I'm sorry, I already talked about John Rylands manuscript. That is in Manchester. It's the bottom of papyrus, which is in Switzerland. Both of them are portions of the book of John from the second century. If you go over to Ireland, to Dublin, you get the Chester Beatty manuscripts, where are the four Gospels, the book of Acts, and the book of Revelation, all from the third century AD. And then if you come to London, oh, come to London. I love to show you what we have in London. For those of you who don't know, I live in London. 
And I go to London all the time. I go to one particular place called the Ridblatt Gallery there in the British Library. If you come to the Ridblatt Gallery, I'm going to show you two of the oldest Bibles in the world, two of the oldest New Testaments, and also one which is the Old and New Testament. The Sinaiticus is right there. The Sinaiticus, the entire New Testament, written in Koinonia Greek, written in the Uncial, capitalized Greek text. There it is from the 4th century A.D found there in Mount Sinai by Tischendorf when he was going through the Sinai Peninsula, came into the mount, a monastery there in Mount Sinai and saw that they were going to burn it. They had it in a waste paper basket because they had no idea of the its importance. He rescued it, brought it back to England. They sent it up to Russia. They dated it. They brought it back to England. Now the English government now owns it. They have bought it, and it is the oldest New Testament anywhere in the world, the entire New Testament from 320 to 325 A.D., 4th century. Predates the Quran by 300 years. Beautiful. Written not on papyrus, written on parchment, on gazelle skin. It's pristine. You can go see it for yourself. Right next to it is the Alexandrinus, the entire Old and New Testament. There it is written in Uncial Greek from the 5th century. The only other book that is as close to that is the Vaticanus in Rome. The Vaticanus, which is there in the Vatican, which is the Old and New Testament written from the mid-4th century. So you have the Sinaiticus, the Vaticanus, and the Alexandrinus, three of the great metropolitan codices of the New Testament and the Old Testament written in the 4th and 5th century. That's three to 200 years before the Quran. That's what kind of manuscript evidence we have. But that's not all. We've got more than that. You want to hear more, don't you? What else do we have to support that? Well, we have the eyewitness accounts, but we also have the hostile accounts. The hostile accounts. These are the writers that were writing, the historians that were writing in the same period or immediately after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they do talk about their crucifixion. That's what I like about it because the Muslims dispute the crucifixion. They don't like the crucifixion. So you have men like Thallus. Thallus, who is a Greek historian, who was basically debating with another man named Phlegon. And the two of them were debating about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in 52 AD. Roughly 20 years after Christ's death, you have these two Greek historians debating that at the time that Jesus died, when he was on the cross, the earth shook and the sun went dark. 20 years after Christ's death. Now, they didn't worship Christ, or they didn't follow Christ, but that's not what we need them for. We need to know whether or not they agreed that Christ died on the cross. Tacitus, who absolutely hated Christians, he had nothing good to say of Christians. He was a Roman historian. He was living in about 80, to, uh, writing about 80 to 84 AD. He not only mentions that Jesus died, he also mentioned that when he died, he died during the reign of Tiberius under Pontius Pilate, which exactly corroborates Luke chapter 3, verse 1. It's proving that it happened at the right time, at the right place, with the right person. But Tacitus had nothing good to say about Christians. In fact, he even mentioned that the Christian, these are this horrendous group of people, believed that this Jesus was a God, proving the divinity of Jesus as far as the Christians were concerned, as early, as early as the late first century. Josephus, a Hebrew historian, writing at the end of the first century, the beginning of the second century, he mentions not only the death of Jesus, but he also does as a curious reference there to the to the fact that the Christians believe that Jesus rose again. Now, the historians hate that. They don't like the reference to Josephus. They say we cannot trust it because it's written so late. Now, here they are telling Josephus that he cannot be trusted because the material is written so late, but they don't have any problem with trusting Thucydides or Herodotus or any of these other characters whose writings don't even come to us until the 9th and 10th and 11th century AD. Can you see there's a double standard here? They don't trust, they want to trust any historical writer when he writes about Jesus, but they'll trust everything else he says. To me, there's an agenda there. There's a bias built into that, and I don't buy it. Historians have to do better than that. If they're not going to accept Josephus, if they're not going to accept the New Testament writers, then they're not going to accept any of the writers. You have to throw them all away, because none of the other writers even appear on this world stage until the 9th century AD. You have to be careful of what about historians, what their agenda is. But here you have a Greek historian, a Roman historian, a Hebrew historian, all of them admitting that Jesus died on the cross. They didn't accept who Jesus was or what he came to do. We're not asking them to do that. All we're asking them is, did the event happen? Did it happen at the right place, at the right time, with the right person? That's all we're asking, the historical question. What else can we go to? Well, see, not only do we have the manuscripts, over 26,000, we also have versions within those manuscripts. In fact, we have over 19,000 uh, different translations in 11 different languages. We have Latin 
over 10,000 Latin Vulgates that begin to appear in the second century. We have almost 350 Syriac translations that begin to appear in the mid second century. We have 100 Coptic translations from the third and fourth century. We have over 2,500 Armenian translations from the fifth century. We have Gothic translations from the sixth century. I'm sorry, from the fourth century. We have Georgian and Slavic translations, over 4,000. Georgian and Slavic translations from the 5th century. We have over 2,000 Ethiopic translations from the 6th century and Nubian translations from this, and it goes on and on. Over 11 different languages, 19,000 translations. Now stop and think what the Muslims are telling us. They've said that we've gone through and we have corrupted all of this. We have changed it along the way. If we had wanted to do that, we'd have to go to every one of those 19,000 translations in all 11 languages, change them all so they're consistent and nobody know about it. Can you see what they're suggesting? Now that would be a miracle. The fact that they are all there and they are all consistent and they all agree with the manuscript evidence shows how authoritative our New Testament is. But that's still not enough for me. We have something else besides that. How about the lectionaries? 2,135 lectionaries written in the 6th century. The early church in the 6th century, what they would do is they would come and they would have do liturgy during the church service. And what they would do for their liturgy, basically, is they would just repeat scripture. And it was this repeated scripture that they would use that is written down that we have available to us today, over 2,000 of them, that predate the Quran by 100 years. And there they are corroborating the manuscript evidence, corroborating all the translation, proving that it had not been changed along the way. But there's still something better than all of this. Something better than the manuscripts and the translations, and the hostile witnesses, the, the lectionaries, I've, laid, I've saved the, le the best to last. When the gospel writers were writing their material down, and when Paul was writing these down, they would disseminate these out to the different churches around the diaspora. And as they started reading these in the different churches, there were people in these churches that started disputing them. We do know that the Gnostic, the Gnos the Gnostic uh, sect sectarian group did not like the fact that God could be a man or that God could be a person. There were other groups like the Docetists and the Coloridians and the Monarchists who did not like the guy, idea that God could enter time and space and take on human form. And so they started disputing against who Jesus Christ was. And these writings of theirs start to appear in the second century. Now, the early church fathers knew that they had to confront these during writings. They knew they had to confront the Gnostic writers especially. But they did a very clever thing. Rather than sit there and dispute them philosophically like we do in debate, they did a much more simple thing. They just took scripture and wrote it out. They just took gospel accounts, word for word, verse for verse, chapter for chapter, disputing whatever the Gnostic writers were saying. They just reiterated what the gospel account said. They just reiterated what Paul said. And they wrote it out and they sent these letters to the different churches. Now, why did they do that? Well, for them, as far as they were concerned, the canonical text was all that was needed to basically prove their point. But see, I think God had them do that for a very good purpose. Because he knew that this was going to be disputed in the 20th and the 21st century. He knew that we were going to have to prove the authenticity of the manuscript evidence. He knew that there was going to have to be something better than the manuscript itself in order to corroborate what the manuscript said. And that's why I think he had the early church fathers write these down. Write these verses down, verse by verse by verse so that we could start amalgamating and collecting them. Two men, Dr. Sir David Dalrymple and Dr. Jean Burgon, have done just that. They have amalgamated, they have pulled together as many of these early church fathers' quotations as they could, and they've come up with over 86,000 quotations. Over 86,000 quotations they've been able to pull together. But then they wanted to find out how many of these quotations predate the 4th century. How many of these quotations predate the Sinaiticus and the Alexandrinus and the Vaticanus, <clears throat> the earliest entire New Testaments that we have. How many of them predate the Council of Nicaea? Why? Because many people believe it is at the Council of Nicaea that the canon of the Bible was created. It was not created at the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea was not convened to create any canon. It was convened basically to dispute against the Arians, those who believed that Jesus was only a man. Athanasius was given that responsibility. It just so happened that they listed the 27 books that were, they were going to use as their authority. So it was basically there to show what was already accepted in the church. These were well accepted. And the reason we know that is by looking at their quotations. The quotations always accepted these 27 books. And they always use only these 27 books to dispute against the sectarian writings. So they wanted to find out how many of these quotations predated the 4th century, predated 325. 
and they came up with these. They came up with over 2,400 quotes from Clement of Alexandria in the second century. Or they came up with over 7,000 quotes from Tertullian himself in the mid-second century. From the church father Justin Martyr, they came up with 330 quotes. From Uranius in the late second century, they came up with 1,800 quotes. Oregon, almost 18,000 quotes. Hippolytus, 1,300 quotes. Eusebius, over 5,000 quotes. When you add up all these quotations, you come up with 36,000 quotations. 36,000 quotations that predate the 4th century. 36,000 quotations that predate the 4th century. But that's not good enough. They wanted to find out how much of the New Testament these encapsulated. So they started putting these quotations in chronological order, starting with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all the way to Revelation. And you know what they found? When they put it in chronological order, they found that they could reproduce all 27 books of the New Testament. All 27 books of the New Testament, except for 11 insignificant verses. Ooh, choo -choo 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 -choo. Do you see what we're saying here? There are over 5,000 verses in the New Testament. Just with these quotations, they could reproduce the entire 27 books of the New Testament from Matthew all the way to Revelation from before the 4th century. Oh, you, you, you. What that tells me is that we can throw away the manuscripts. We don't need them. Throw all 26,000 away. We don't need them. We can still reproduce the New Testament. We can throw away the 19,000 translations. Throw away the 2,135 lectionaries. Throw away all this manuscript evidence and just come back to the early church fathers' quotations and still reproduce the entire New Testament, all 27 books from before the Council of Nicaea, except for 11 insignificant verses. Ah, that makes me happy. I hope that's making you happy too. There is no other piece of literature, both secular or sacred, can make the claim I've just made. That's how authoritative our New Testament is. Be proud of your New Testament. Don't ever apologize for the New Testament. Not with this kind of material. Not with this kind of evidence. Now, we need to just do one more thing. What I want to do is look at its further evidence for the Bible. And we're going to end with this part here. We're going to try to go through it as quick as possible because I see I've already done an hour and 15 minutes. Let's try to finish this off in the next 15 minutes. Let, what other evidence do we have for the Bible to prove its authenticity? We've looked at the historical evidence of the Old Testament. We looked at the manuscript evidence, archaeological evidence for the Old Testament. We looked at the manuscript evidence, the documentary evidence for the New Testament. I don't think anybody in this room has any doubt that there is a lot of corroboration, historical corroboration. We have done our homework. It's great to know we've done our homework. But is there any other evidence that we can look at? And there is. We can look at the fulfilled prophecies. Why? The fulfilled prophecies are very essential because it showed just how authoritative the internal evidence is from within. And there are two people, especially both Moses and Isaiah, that have the most fulfilled prophecies. We can see prophecy after prophecy that was fulfilled almost the next day, such as the defeat of the Egyptian in Exodus 14. That we see the, uh, a reference of a prophecy that was filled almost immediately. The holding back of the sun in Isaiah 37, 38 by Isaiah himself, the, uh, by, by God himself under, the, under the, uh, uh, the calling of Isaiah, or Sennacherib's route that we just talked about earlier in Isaiah 37 of the 185,000. That's in a fulfillment almost immediately of a prophecy. Some of the prophecy was fulfilled much later, 150 to 200 years later, sometimes centuries later, and sometimes even today, such as the exile of the, of the Israelites to Babylon that we see in Isaiah chapter 39, verse 6 and 7, or the blessings and curses of Israel in Deuteronomy 28, also chapter 30, or the fall of Babylon that we talked about earlier which we find prophesied in Isaiah 13, verse 1, and verse 19 and 20. That we know happened in 539 B.C. Or the return from exile that we see in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11 and 12. We know that that happened because of what happened in Ezra and Nehemiah. So you have lots of these fulfilled prophecies that gives the authority, internal authority, for its authenticity. You also have it's the harmony, the fact that it's unity and harmony all the way through. Here is a book that was written over 1,500 years by over 30 authors in three different languages on three different continents, yet it has the same story right through. There is no inconsistency. All the Muslims have tried to find all kinds of inconsistency. When I did a debate a number of years ago, back in about 10 years ago, uh, Shabir Ali, the great debater out of Toronto, handed me a pamphlet which said 101 clear contradictions of the Bible. 
I looked at those contradictions, and I, along with four other friends, we went together and we put our heads together, and we came up with references and answers to every one of them. The next debate I had with him at Leicester University, I think it was in 1998, I handed him another pamphlet, and on it it says, 101 cleared up contradictions of the Bible. You can go and online and pull it down at debate.org.uk. It's right there for you to use. 101 cleared up contradictions of the Bible. What we found is that the Muslims have looked the Bible trying to find any contradiction in these, in these 66 books. And every time they found a contradiction, they were easy to show that they were not contradictions. They just sometimes they just needed to read the verse before or the verse after or read the chapter before or look at the word or understand what the author was trying to say. They made 15 basic errors all the way through. And we showed every one of them. That's why you don't need to memorize all the answers. Go up on our paper, pull it down, give it to your Muslim friend, and next time they throw you a, a pamphlet like that. Thank God we don't have these contradictions. Thank God it all fits. Thank God it all makes sense. But you would not expect that over 1,500 years, would you? Can you see how beautiful, harmonious, and unified it is? We also know that it has amazing circulation. This book has been printed and sent out to more people than any other book in history. It has been translated in over 2,000 languages. Every two weeks, a new translation comes online. 93% of the entire world's population now can read the New Testament in their own mother tongue. No other piece of literature can make that claim. They say within another 60 years, every known language will have the New Testament written and translated. What about its wisdom and high moral teaching? I find it fascinating when I talk to people around the world. I lived in Japan. I remember talking in Japan back in the 1970s. I used to ask my students there in Japan, why is it that you don't follow Shinto law? They said, no, no, we don't follow Shinto law. We follow the law that was given to us by MacArthur, by the Americans after the Second World War. And I say, why? Because it's a lot more just. I said, do you realize that the law that you're following is basically biblical law? Well, it doesn't matter. It's a lot better than the Shinto law. I remember living in, in Senegal, in West Africa. For five years, my wife and I lived in Senegal, and there was a population of 92% Muslim population. And I remember asking them, why is it you don't follow Islamic law, Sharia law? They said, no, 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 we follow Western law, we follow French law. The French gave us this in our colony. I said, well, yes, but you've been free now for 50 years. Why don't you go back to your Islamic law? They said, no, 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 no. We don't want to start cutting off hands of, of thieves. We don't want to start slicing off the heads of the unbelievers. We don't want to start uh, beating our wives. French law is a lot more just. I said, do you realize that French law is based on biblical principles, on Judeo-Christian law? They had no idea. And everywhere you go, I, talk, I say this to my Muslim friend all the time, why is it that whenever you go around the world, when you look at Muslim countries, there are very few countries that apply Islamic law. They cannot f apply the hudud laws because they are barbaric. They are meant for the 7th century. Yet Judeo-Christian law is universal. And how do I know that? Well, one of the best documents you can look in the world today that is the most universal secular document that is accepted by the most number of people around the world is what we call the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Take a look at the UN Declarations of Human Rights and you will see exactly what I'm saying. The UN Declaration of Human Rights is the most universal secular document that is used as a standard today for morality. And yet there are 21 articles. But when you look at the 21 articles, you will see almost every one of them is biblical. But there are a number of articles that Muslims cannot accept, even though they've signed up to them. Let me give you some examples. Article 4, no slavery is permitted. Now stop and think. Many of my Muslim friends say this is, this is uniquely a Christian problem. I say it is. That's interesting. Long before the Europeans got involved in the slave trade, they, the Arabs were involved with for over a thousand years beforehand. In fact, when the Europeans finally got to Africa and started getting slaves, who do you think sold them the slaves? It was the Arabs that sold the slaves. What's more, there has been a man named Dr. John Azuma, who has now done a doctorate at Birmingham, who has looked at the slave trade in Africa. He's from Ghana himself, and he's gone over and he's found that, that in the West Coast, there was about 11 to 12 million, million slaves that left the West Coast, and they all came to places like Brazil and South America, and uh, uh, only, uh, only, interestingly, they found out that only 5% of all the slaves that West, left the West Africa went to America. All the rest came down to South America. But we know where their progeny is today. We know where their descendants are. Look around South America. Look around Brazil. Look around the United States. And you will see, in the United States, we have over 30 million of their descendants living in the United States today. We can see them. They're still alive today. What we didn't know is that in the East Africa, there were also slaves being sold. 
in fact, even more than in the West Africa. There was almost 14, as many as some estimates, maybe as high as 20 million slaves were sold out of East Africa, out of places like Zanzibar, Lamo, you've heard these names before, these are slave islands. Where did all those slaves go to? They all went up, not to the Western world, they all went up to the Arab world, to the Middle East. Yet where are their descendants? According to the statistics of the number of slaves that left the East Africa, there should be anywhere from 80 to 100 million descendants living today in the Middle East. Where are they? They've just disappeared. Now this is going to have huge repercussions. Muslims have not dealt with their slave problem. What happened to those millions upon millions of slaves that should be living today? We know where the West African slaves are. They're all living today. Their descendants are found all over North and South America. We can't find the East African slaves, their descendants. What's more, I ask my Muslim friend, you say that this is uniquely a Christian problem. Let me ask you, who abolished slavery? We're celebrating the 200th centennial of the abol abolition of slavery in 1807 by a man named Wilberforce. Wilberforce was a Christian, and he spent his whole life, spent his whole life trying to eradicate slavery because of his Christian principles. In 1807 was the first place, the first country, Britain was the first country to abolish slavery, and other countries started following that. My country in America finally abolished slavery about 50 years later, and other European countries started to follow suit. But who were the last countries to abolish slavery? They were all Muslim countries. Saudi Arabia only abolished slavery in 1960. Mauritania, the last remaining country to abolish slavery, a solidly Muslim country, only abolished it in 1981. Less than over, just about 25 years ago. Who's got the problem here? Christianity or Islam? I say, show me one abolition movement in Islam. There has never been an abolition movement. There has never been any movement to abolish slavery in Islam. It is uniquely a Christian enterprise. Even the missionaries in Africa created the, the country of Sierra Leone to take their, their freed slaves and put them there so they would not be re-enslaved today. Even today, it still exists. Baroness Cox, who lives not too far from me in London, who she's part of the House of Lords, she goes down regularly down to North Africa, takes a film crew with her, she goes to Sudan in Mauritania, she goes to the slave houses there, and she buys slaves on camera and then sets them free to prove that it still exists today. It only exists in Muslim lands. And what's the tragedy is that in the United States, Many Afro-Americans are becoming Muslims because they believe that Islam does not have a problem with slavery, that this is uniquely a Christian problem. Can you see the lie that they're perpetrating? Look at the historical record. Look and ask, who were the ones that abolished slavery? Christians. Christianity and Christians abolished slavery. Why? Because in Galatians 3, it says very clearly there is no difference between male and female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free. All are equal in Christ. That's why we abolish slavery. The slaves are our brothers. Even when uh, Paul sent Philemon home as a slave because he had to under the jurisdiction that happened in the first century, when he sent him home to Philemon, what did he say? He said, no longer is he your slave, he is now your brother in Christ. He redefined slavery right there in one fell swoop. Thank God for what Paul saw as early as 2,000 years ago. He was way ahead of his time. Article 4. What are the Muslims going to do with Article 4? Article 6, Article 7, I'm sorry, Article 5, it says no cruel or degrading punishment. The Bible forbids it in Matthew 5, 39, in Matthew 26, 52, in Luke 6, 27 and 28, in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Look and see, we're not permitted to do that, yet look and see what Islam does. Islam allows for thieves to have their hands cut off, according to Surah 5, Ayah 37. It allows for unbelievers to have their heads cut off, according to Surah 47, Ayah 4. It says that, those, that the, 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 those who stand against Islam must have their hands and feet cut off on opposite ends. What kind of punishment is that? That's barbaric, and yet that's exactly what we find in the Quran. I could go on and on and on with all the Islamic law, the inequality that's in Islamic law, built into Islamic law. We don't have time to do it today. Of course they have to stand against Article 5. Article 7, Articles 8, and Articles 10 said that there is to be equality right across the board for men, women, for it doesn't matter what race, doesn't matter what creed, there must be equality. The Bible encourages, as I said earlier, in Galatians 3, verse 28. Yet look and see what the Quran does with the equality. It doesn't allow 
non-Muslims to participate in government. It does not allow non-Muslims to participate in judiciary. It allows no kufr to participate in the police force or in the, in the in military. If you don't have any participation in the politics or the judiciary or the police or within the military, you have basically eradicated any position of power. It does not allow equality. Article 16 says that marriage and divorce must be equal. The Bible mentions that a man may only have one wife, shows that there's equality between men and women. Yet the Quran stipulates that a man may have up to four wives in Surah 4, Ayah 1. Although the Prophet himself had up to 12 wives, he didn't even keep to his own jurisdiction. Article 18 said there must be freedom of thought and religion, that men and women should be able to change their religion. The Bible allows it in John 3.16 and Romans 10, verse 9 to 15. Yet the Quran stipulates that nobody can become, nobody can leave Islam. They give them three days to repent according to Islamic law. And after three days, if they have not repented, they must execute them. No wonder they cannot sign up to Article 18. Article 19, freedom of opinion and expression. The Bible says that there is no censorship, only that the only thing that must not be changed is the scripture, and that we find that in Revelations 22. Yet Islam does not allow criticism of the Quran or of the Prophet. Those are the two taboos that are not permitted in Islam. The 295C law that is now instigated there in Pakistan stipulates that if anybody criticized this book or criticized the Prophet, it's an executable offense. No wonder they can't sign up to Article 19. Article 4, Article 5, Article 7, Article 8, Article 10, Article 16, Article 18, Article 19, and Article 20. Nine articles which stand against Islam. No wonder the Muslims have a problem with the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Yet over 150 countries have now signed up to that article, to that declaration, excuse me. And all those articles are biblically based. Why is it that all these non-Christian countries will sign that declaration? Because they see something unique Something just, something universal. Can you see how universal our Bible is? Isn't it exciting? 66,000 people die every day. 70,000 people receive Christ every day. Evangelical Christianity is growing faster than even Islam. Islam has conversion growth. When it comes to conversion growth, Islam has about 2.5% two, about two conversion growth. Evangelical Christians have about 5% conversion growth. Proving that there's something about Christianity, there's something about the biblical truth that evangelicals adhere to that attracts even the non-believers. And this gets me excited. Now let's all wrap it up and let's see what we've said today. What we've said is this Bible is going to be challenged. And yes, it's going to be challenged. It's been challenged by many individuals. And all ever since the Dubigan School started challenging in the late 1800s, it's been challenged. It will continue to be challenged, and rightly so, it needs to be challenged. Any scripture which claims to be the word of God must be challenged. But it must be challenged accurately. It must be challenged on a historical account. It must be challenged by looking at the names, the dates, the places, and the events. And when we do that, the Bible stands up, resurrect. In fact, it's the only book that can stand resolute. No other book can make the claims the Bible can make. Certainly not this book. I haven't even got into all the historical anachronisms of this book. I don't have time to do that. But the Bible has never, there has never been found one piece of evidence that shows that this book is incorrect historically. When we look at the archaeological evidence, it supports everything we know about what the Bible said. When we look at the manuscript evidence for the New Testament, just look at the myriad of examples of manuscripts we have. 26,000 manuscripts, 2,135 lectionaries, 19,000 translations in 11 different languages, 86,000 quotations, 36,000 which predate the 4th century. When you put them all together, they reproduce the entire New Testament except for 11 verses, all before the Council of Nicaea, all before the Sinaiticus. Look what kind of authority we have for the New Testament. Look at the internal evidence. Look at the fact that it is all consistent, 1,500 years of revelation by over 30 different authors, yet they all say the same thing. No inconsistencies, no, con no contradictions. I have no problem believing that this is the Word of God. I don't ask you to believe it's the Word of God. All I ask you to believe is that it's accurate. When it deals with history, when it takes, talks about people's names, places, and events, on that level, on that level at least, we can say it's accurate. If it's accurate on that level, then we can begin to open its pages and trust what it has to say. But what it has to say is, what is quite a story.
starting from the very beginning in Genesis, in the creation of mankind, Adam and Eve, all the way to the resurrection, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, all the way to the revelation at the very end where we're heading on the other side of death. It's a great story. And it's a story that I can believe. Not just because we've done our homework by looking at the artifacts that the British stole and brought to the British Museum, the artifacts which support the book of Genesis, which support the first and second kings and first and second chronicles, and thank God for the book of Daniel. Not just because of that evidence, but because of who the person that it speaks about within its pages. It all points to one man, Jesus Christ. What a man. 300 prophecies that support and point to what he was going to do, where he's going to live, where he's going to be born, how he's going to die, between whom he's going to die, even where he's going to be born, uh, buried, excuse me, and the fact that he was going to resurrect again. Thank God for the Bible. It gives me not only hope for the future, it gives me hope for all of you. But not just for all of you, also for my Muslim friends. We need to share the Bible with them. And we must never apologize. We don't need to apologize. There's too much that now has been done, too much research that has been done. Yes, it's going to continue to be challenged, but it meets every challenge. I hope you feel confident for the Bible. I hope you use it, because it's better than any other piece of literature. It's what's going to save you, it's what's going to keep you directed, and it's what's going to introduce you to the God that is the God who comes down to earth and, yes, has relationship with us. That's a God I want to know, and this book tells you all about him. It's a great book. Let's use it, and let's share it.